the Valley of Vision Part 2. We have extended uh, from verse 4 to verse 7. The ironic weakness, the thought that we uh, began last week, when we were describing this scene that is before us concerning the prophecy of Isaiah to the city of Jerusalem. Here you would see a description that is given to us concerning the city of Jerusalem. It is called the Valley of Vision. The valley is a beautiful place because in the valley you see the water flowing down to nourish it from the highlands and that is where life is. So the prophet uses this description, the valley of vision, to show us uh, the life that was to be in the house of God and to show to us a contrast. Whereas it should be strong, whereas it should be a fortress, a refuge, now it has become weak. An ironic weakness The city of Babylon, which we saw in chapter 21, is called the desert of the sea. The desert of the sea. It's called a desert. Whereas the city of Jerusalem is called a valley, a valley of vision. Whereas one is described, though rich in the things of this world, rich in all that we would call it, rich, uh, with all the prestige that is there, and yet it is called a desert. A desert of the sea, a description of its vastness, perhaps, uh, of its great uh, 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 span, uh, perhaps describing the broad way of life without God, as opposed to the narrow way, uh, and here you see there is, a, there is a contrast that the Lord wants to bring to us here as He shows us the blessedness of the people of God with God with them. What a wonderful picture that they have, the prophets, they have the seers among them. Blessed are their eyes because they could see, they could understand things around them. Their prophets would have been endowed by God to be able to see things and to be able to explain what is going on, isn't it? And that was the blessing of the nation of Israel. They had God with them. And there in the temple of God is the presence of God. It is like the command post, the command post of, of uh, the, all, the, all that is happening in the field. Well, isn't it very uh, significant? Uh, well, I come from... Uh, 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 manufacturing a semiconductor background and we have the opportunity to be able to see for example the things that are going on in the process of the manufacturing of the product and it goes from one place to another place to another place to another place before it is finally delivered to the final place and you could see how things were brought together how things were put together and there, uh, the scheduler or the people uh, there with the system in front of them, they are able to make certain decisions and they would be able to see the movements of things that goes on worldwide. Right? Factories everywhere and the movement you could see. 
the things that are being put together. Ah, how marvelous is that picture? And when you are there, you you have the luxury of pressing buttons and you know seeing things move. Wow, what a what a uh, what a what a uh, 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 position of privilege, isn't it? That was Israel. Israel had God with them, and therefore, omnipotence, omnipresence, omniscience. They had the all-knowing God, the all-wise God. They had the all-powerful God with them, the ever-present God who can see all things everywhere. So when you have the Lord with them, they were supposed to be the most blessed of all people, isn't it? When we have the Bible with us, when we have uh, uh, ministers with us to show us the way uh, that the Lord is leading us, how privileged we are. And therefore, we would expect to see fruit and you'd expect to see in the valley life, isn't it? Life flowing uh, in that valley. But here, the valley of vision is, is described as a burden. How come it has become a burden? It was a place where, it dis where blessings are dispensed but it has now become a burden. Oh. Well, why has it become a, a burden? Because you see that the people in that city were no longer the the city on the hill, the city with a light shining as a, a, a beacon to show the way. And Matthew Henry keenly observed, he says, now the burden of the valley of vision here is that which will not quite ruin it but will frighten it. For it refers not to the destruction of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar, but to the attempt made upon it by Sennacherib, which had the prophecy of Isaiah 10 and shall meet with the history of Isaiah 36. The Assyrian army is going to come and is going to impoverish the city of God. But they are supposed to be a city of God. Why were they impoverished? Well, you see here in our text a description of the terror that is shown to us of the, of the city of Jerusalem. It is supposed to be a city prospering with the vision of God and with the laws of God where the people of God are the happiest people because they have the wherewithal for life. But what has taken place? Why is the city now become... Uh, fearful? Why is there a, a change uh, that is taking place? Well, here is described in our text here in verse 2, Thy slain men are not slain with the sword, nor dead in battle. You would think that for a city that is strong, it would stand up to its enemies, isn't it? But here, 
the city is not standing up to it, its enemies. But, and the slain men were not slain with the sword. They were not fighting. They were not fighting at all. But worse, verse 3 tells us that the rulers are fled together. The rulers are running away. They are leaving the people behind. And here is described for us the weakness that has taken place in the land of Israel over a period of time. Things has changed and gotten to the worst. So from the time when Moses gave the law, you remember we just completed the book of Deuteronomy and God through Moses, rehearsed the laws because they were about to inherit the promised land. God is going to give them victory over their enemies and they, are, they have the laws of God and they are going to overrun every city in Canaan. They are going to have the victory. And it was a... a a really uh, high point, we say, in Israel's history. For they had the best generation with them. But as we were observing, 80%, we said 80%, they were, they were following God, walking with God, only about 80%. But they were the best already. As you look further from the book of Joshua to the book of Judges and to the time of the kings from 1500 BC to 1000 BC, a period of 500 years, ah, you see there is a period of change that has taken place. Well, Israel was strong. They conquered the land and they were in the land. But suddenly, they became weak again. Why were they weak during the time of the judges? Well, every time you see when the people of God are spiritually weak, it is because they have turned their allegiance from the Lord. They have turned themselves away from following God. And that has always been the situation in the history of God's people. And by the time it was 1000 BC, uh, Israel was united as a nation under David 40 years and then came Solomon. Solomon built the temple. It was so glorious. It is described for us, uh, the glory of the temple. And David penned a psalm specifically for Solomon uh, so that he anointed to build the temple of God. It will be the most glorious temple. And he wrote in a psalm 127 verse 1 to 2, he says, except the Lord built the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so giveth he his beloved sleep. There's a kind of endeavor that is profitable in life. But there is a kind of endeavor that doesn't add up. And at this time in the life of the history of Israel, in the divided kingdom, you see that things doesn't add up. They were not secure. They were not trusting the Lord. You see, that's the trouble with the people of God. They come through uh, with certain uh, 
uh, time where they experienced revival and they were close to God. And then when the Lord would bless them with His presence, uh, there would come a time of complacency that would take place. And the Lord through Moses has warned them right, of that complacency that would take place. The Lord told them that idolatry would come in and, and prosperity would come in. These are the two things that will turn their heart away. Prosperity will turn their hearts away because they would be bathing in the success that God has given to them. And then their heart began to... to well, that's the, the description of the falling away of the people of God. Why is it like that? You know, to re receive God's blessing is a, it's a good thing, isn't it? That you would, uh, the Lord is with you and the Lord um, brought the former rain and the latter rain so you have your harvest and you are happy with each time the harvest comes. But the trouble with the people of God is that when the Lord prospered them, there is, there, there, there is come a time when they were looking to their fortifications, looking to themselves, looking to the what they have for their security, rather than looking to God. You see, when Solomon built the temple, when he was tasked to build that first temple, it was not by his own strength. It was not by his own wisdom. He was reliant on God's strength and God's wisdom. And so, that was how the temple was built. And it was glorious. 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 10 to 11 tells us of God's presence with them. And it came to pass when the priest will come out of the holy place and the, that the cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of the Lord. Here we see how wonderful it is of industriousness that is tinged with a strong sense of reliance on God's providence for true success. In other words, we are working hard. But our hard work is undergirded by God, leading us along. Our strength is not our own strength. It's the strength of the Lord that He has given us. And here... The, the conditional clause, except, except the Lord built the, built the house. They labor in vain, except. Here is described twice a real condition to be fulfilled. That it will be an undeniable fact that God, if God is not in the building equation, the project will fail. And by the double use of the negative not there, uh, or low in the Hebrew, if God does not protect the city, it will fail. So if God does not undergird us in any work that we do, it will fizzle to nothing. Except the Lord would bless. You see. So there was the rich man who wanted to build a bigger barn without God's blessing. And what did the Lord say to him? Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. 
take thy ease, eat, drink, and be merry. And God said to him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall these things be, those things be, which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself, and is not rich toward God. So here is a description of trembling because the city of Jerusalem was not rich toward God. When we have not God with us, that was the scene with Belshazzar, the last Babylonian king, who did not acknowledge God. God sent his judgment by his own handwriting on the wall of the banquet hall. Belshazzar blasphemed God by using the vessels taken from the temple to drink and the writing of the wall on the wall. Mini, mini, tikal, upasin. This is the interpretation of the thing. Many God has numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Tikal, thou hast weighed in the thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting. Perez, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. God's judgment came upon him that very night. Daniel chapter 5, the last two verses. In that night Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, slain was slain, and Darius the meat took over the kingdom, being three score and two years old. The ironic weakness, that's the thought that we have. God's people are supposed to be strong. They are supposed to have God with them. And why is it that here you see Isaiah in chapter 21 and 22 Lumping Babylon, Edom, Arabia, three hidden lands with the dwelling place of God. What has God's, God's house to do with the, 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 the lands of the world, the city of worldly powers? What has it got to do with the city of the living God? What was the association we were mentioning? Well, the association is this, that Jerusalem is now like Babylon. What a sad thing. When the house of God, the homes of God, the people of God are not worshipping God anymore. God is not the centre of their endeavour anymore. And although there seemed to be some semblance of piety there, but there was no, there's no real life. There's no real victory. And we are just, they are just trudging along there. And that's a very sad thing, isn't it? When the people of God is dealt with the world. Isaiah laboured the inhabitants as slain men not slain in battle by the sword, but death that comes by pestilence and hunger. Well, that's a slow death that is, that is being described there. And Jeremiah described it uh, here in this way in Lamentations chapter 4 and verse 9. They that be slain with the sword are better than they be slain with hunger. For these pine away stricken through for one of the fruits of the field. A slow death. Slow death. You slowly feel the torture. Whereas if you are slain, well, that's it. One cut, and that's it. Life is gone. Very fast. The pain is little. But here, the description for us is that they are not slain with sword. They didn't die in battle. It was not a glorious, heroic death. But they died because they were surrounded and they couldn't get out. And the prophet describes for us how they became like prisoners in their city. And the rulers, instead of defending them, fled, and we were mentioning how sad it is. Uh, the king Zedekiah 
ran from the garden of the city to escape into the plain. And where did he go? Well, he met the Babylonian army in the plains of Jericho. Jericho was the place where they first entered the city, the, the, the promised land. It was the place where the Lord led them with the conquest to, to overcome their enemy. But it was now a place where uh, they were ruined and overcome by the enemy there. What a reversal, isn't it? What a reversal. So we can begin well, we can continue well in life, in spiritual life, but if we would not be vigilant, if we would not be sober, if we would not be uh, steadfast, then we can fall away very quickly. And here is a description of that falling away. So it's either we would be steadfast following the Lord, striving for the faith of the gospel, fervent, giving our heart to the Lord, or if it's half-hearted, you realize that soon you would fall away. So that's the reason why Moses said to Israel, Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one Lord. There is only one living and true God. There is the creator and sustainer of all things. He is the real controller of all things. He is the commander of all things. And if you loved him, you would serve him, life thrives. But in order to do so, we have to love Him with all our soul, all our heart and all our, our might. It takes, you know, in, 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 again in, in our field, in, in binary code, we said it's one or zero. Right? So we said very simplistic, is it one or zero? Right? Is it a one or zero? Well, it's either you are following the Lord or you are not, isn't it? It's quite clear. And if you follow the Lord, then we need to follow Him with all our heart, soul, mind and strength. And then we will experience His blessings, isn't it? We must give our all to Him. It's not half-hearted cannot be half-hearted. But when we give our all to the Lord, right, you see that life is very different. That's life with God. So Moses said to Israel, Hear, O Israel, love the Lord thy God. Why? Why do you have to love Him with all your heart and soul and mind and strength? Because He loves you with all His heart, soul, mind and strength. He has given you everything, made you everything. The best He has given to you. Do you see it? Will you cherish it? Israel didn't. And they were not serving God with their hearts, but they had idols in their lives. And those idols were ebbing, slowly eating, eating their life away. And that's a very sad thing. And this is a description of the, the gloom that the prophet was trying to paint to us. The city is no longer glorious. Her inhabitants die of famine. Her rulers, who should take measures to defend her and abide with her to the last, flee away. And even at a distance, they are being caught, being captured and bound. The theocracy goes down in disgrace. God's kingdom in disgrace. 
the members of the holy kingdom of God betrayed that kingdom. The people of the world take captive and bind them. How sad it is that we would allow the world to capture us, to take away our affection. And yet, we see that the Lord's plan is not thwarted. The Lord's, the Lord's uh, redemption uh, uh, plan is not in any way um, disturbed by the weakness of the nation of Israel. In fact, by the time of Christ, you will see that God will use just 12 disciples after the Lord was ascended to heaven. 12 disciples. And with this 12, they, all the 12 were, you know, um, nothing. I, they, they, they were counted as nothing by the world. And yet, the Lord will use that 12 to gloriously overturn the entire Roman Empire. And you see, we are not dealing with human strength, human affairs, uh, human ways, but we are talking about God, God's ways. And He's playing the big chess game, as it were, moving the pieces, moving the things around. Can you see it? God moving the things around the world today? Uh, you need to see, isn't it? This is God moving. This piece is from God. He's doing this. He's doing this. Can you see? The Lord wants us to see and to know His plan and to be a part of His plan. Isaiah breaks out in grief and lamentation when he saw the vision. The people of God, what happened to them? They were not serious. They were not loving the Lord. And today we say, are you reading your Bible? We are going through the Old Testament. You know, it takes quite a fair bit of resources to print the Bibles, to collate them, to put them together. And all we have to do is to open our Bibles and to read them. Uh, I pray that you know, our effort is not in vain, it's wasted, but that you are taking time to be serious. You are serious about your own spiritual growth. You are serious about your own spiritual life. You are taking time to, to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. How can we grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ? Except we would take time to, to meditate upon the Word of God. Take time to study the Word of God. Take time to dwell on the God's Word. You see, that's the only way we can grow. Have we been doing that, dwelling upon the Word of God? I say that those who have been dwelling upon the Word of God, well, I hear many good reports of those who have been dwelling on the Word of God, taking time to study how they have made progress, how they are seeing things. God is showing them the things that God wants them to see. I'll just give you an example the names of the line of Shem and the names of the line of Ham. If you were to make a study and trace the names of that line, you would be able to see those are very godly names that are there. The line of Shem. But if you look at the line of Ham, oh, 
what kind of names are there, the description. You don't know what, what's going on with that, that group there. But whereas this, you see there is strength, there is grace. Ah, where are we? Where are we? Well, for if we are not seeking the Lord, then it is the day of trouble, verse 5. For it is the day of trouble and of treading down and of perplexity by the Lord God of hosts in the valley of vision, the breaking down of the walls and the crying to the mountains. The Lord of hosts is now contending with the valley of visions. The enemies with their battering rams are breaking down the walls and they are in vain crying to the mountains. Keep the enemy off. Well, we were mentioning that Israel is... Uh, Jerusalem is surrounded by mountains. They were supposed to be a fortified city. And there in the valley, a really safe place. But the enemy has come. Verse 6, Elam bare the quaver with the chariots of men and horsemen. Kir uncovered the shield, the great numbers of the enemy. And it came to pass that Thy choicest valleys shall be full of chariots, and the horsemen shall set themselves in array at the gates. What is happening? Instead of going to conquer, we are being conquered. They were supposed to be going forth. If we are not going forth with the gospel, what are we doing? We are not going forth with the gospel. We are sitting, resting on our laurels. Well, I say destruction is coming. Curl, that is the meats, muster up their arms, and un shelf their sword, uncover the shield, getting ready for battle. Everything ready for the besieging of Jerusalem. So the choice valleys of Jerusalem, they were used to be clothed with flocks and covered with corn, now shall be full of chariots of war. At the gate of the city, the horsemen shall set themselves in array to cut off all the provisions from going in and to force their way in. What a condition must the city be in that was beset in on all sides with such an enemy, army. Why, why is it happening like that? Why is our life breaking down? Because we are not seeking the Lord. And, but when every time when Israel sought the Lord, God never failed to revive them. God never failed to strengthen them. God never failed to make good their efforts when they would follow Him. That's the history of Israel. And that's a picture that the Lord wants us to see in the Valley of Vision. With such privilege and yet poor results. Why like that? Let it not be so for His church in these last days. You know, God is allowing time for us. We are not going directly, it seems, into the Antichrist kingdom. But God is intervening, working in a miraculous way. And if you see it, you realize that God is still giving us time for the gospel work. Are you not happy that God is giving us time? We are not going directly into the Antichrist kingdom. Are you not happy that the Lord is making, uh, allowing us time to serve Him? Will we use our time wisely to prepare ourselves? Well, I pray that we will do so for His own honour and glory. May the Lord help us. Let us pray. Father, thank Thee for Thy Word. Bless us with Thy presence and comfort us with Thy peace as we look to Thee and help Thy people. Lord, help us to love Thee with all our heart, soul, mind and strength. For Thy own mercy's sake, Help us. This I pray with thanksgiving through Jesus Christ our Lord. 
Amen.